Today on the Basketball Manitoba podcast, we have Amarjeet Bas. He's a professional basketball player who played most recently in the British Basketball League. He is a graduate of Sturgeon Heights Collegiate, where he was ranked third in the province and was selected to the All Manitoba team. After high school, he went on to play at the University of Manitoba, where he helped the program reach the national championship tournament in 2017, the first appearance for the program in 32 years. He ended his career with the Bisons, fourth all time in scoring, third in field goals made, first in three point field goals, sixth in steals, sixth in games played, and second in free throw percentage. After college, he went on to play in England, suiting up for the Newcastle Eagles of the British Basketball League. He also played in Italy and in Germany. He is currently recovering from Achilles surgery and is looking forward to returning back to playing when he's healthy. In the meantime, he's been coaching with the Attack program and the Next Gen Hoop program with Basketball Manitoba. AJ, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Darcy. Thanks for having me, man. It's nice to finally sit down and chop it up. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we, we talked for a little bit before I mentioned at the end there uh, about the Achilles injury. And so I kind of want to just jump in and ask you about that. Um, not necessarily like, hey, all the ins and outs of the injury. I mean, you had an Achilles injury. You did, we'll, be, we'll be clear. You did not rupture your Achilles. You didn't blow your Achilles, but you had uh, and you can talk about that a little bit. But the thing that I want to kind of dive into a little bit here is how hard it's been for you to not play. And more importantly, what have you been doing to kind of I guess, uh, not fill the time, but I mean, as a basketball player, when you, when you don't have basketball, I mean, you're like, yo, what am I supposed to do? So I guess, yeah. What have you been doing to like fill your time and replace some of the stuff you got from basketball, um, into your daily life. And then, you know, maybe tell us a little bit about how the injury recovery is going. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was like micro tears, you know, so it wasn't a full rupture, uh, it's had micro tears over, you know, course of a couple of years. And then it just got to a point where I needed surgery uh, to continue playing. It was just too painful, just day-to-day living and stuff. So um, when, uh, when basketball got removed from me, you know, like I had surgery back in March, um, it's, it's a huge void to, to fill, like a huge time commitment, like life commitment, you know, like, it's like, it's like you're everything, like everything revolves around mm-hmm. that in terms of training and working out and playing and X, Y, Z. So uh, it was tough, man. It's, uh, it's not easy, you know, and uh, I, the, the, the biggest thing I did was kind of just, you know, finding people to like relate to, um, you know, like seeing athletes you look up to and you watch all the time and like what they went through and like listen to their interviews and stuff like that. So, you know, kind of relate to it and motivate yourself. Um, so you know, just doing it like, a lot of a lot of watching watching stuff reading um but honestly the biggest thing um takes up my time now is uh, was my dog like i got a dog in <laughs> nice. the pandemic you know nice. it's like my son my best friend you know like we we're together inseparable every day <laughs> nice what, what kind of dog is it uh he's uh he's a labrador retriever Golden okay Lab retriever mix yeah so That's he's what's turning, up. turning too soon nice Shout out with my boy simba I was going to say, what's his name? You got to shut him up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Simba. Nice. Nice. So did you, did you pick up any, uh, any hobbies, anything, uh, new practices? Like, I mean, again, I know, and this, you know, maybe, and I'll ask a question right now because this kind of coincides with something that most people felt during the pandemic as well. Right. So you had injury plus pandemic, you kind of, I mean, cause could correct me if I'm wrong. We were talking offline, you f- during the pandemic season was when you came back, right? Was it that, was that correct? Yeah. 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 So I had the, the, like a story of where I'm overseas when the pandemic kicks in. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm playing in England and the, and the pandemic kicks in, but this is, this is the time where it's like the first couple of days, right? You hear about it in China. It's not going to affect us. Not going to affect us, you know? And then (laughs) another day goes by and you're like, Oh, it's spread to Europe. Oh, it's in America now. And then, and then you have the infamous Rudy Gobert video, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so it went from like, ah, oh, it's whatever to within like 48 hours. It's like, oh, the NBA shut down. Like, I'm like, if they're shut down, like, how are we not shut down? You know, like I'm texting like group chats going crazy over there. Like all my friends, like, and this, this is during like, uh, like Keith is overseas and justice is overseas and myself and, you know, a bunch of our friends and we're all, we're all in different time zone countries talking like, Oh, did your country shut down? Oh, did Europe shut yeah. down? And so these guys are all heading back and 
mine was the the last one. Like all the guys had come back to Winnipeg and they didn't cancel our league yet. <laughs> and then, like, it was like the day the Prime Minister Trudeau hops on the TV and he's like, Canadians abroad, like come home. You know, like this is your time to come home, blah, blah, blah. So that's that's when our team sort of booked our flights sent us home and then within the next couple of days the league had shut it down i was like that if the nhl and nba <laughs> and they're all shut down like, we're gonna right. shut down as well like you know? yeah no doubt um no so doubt. it was it was so weird like i'm in i'm in heathrow airport one of the yeah. biggest craziest airports in the world you know it's like pearson on steroids and it was a ghost town like That's i'm crazy. in the middle of london and no one's around me. Like, I'm like, this is kind of creepy. You know, like I'm in, I'm in Heathrow with zero lines. Like I'm just walking up to the plane. I'm sitting by myself. That's crazy. Know? And I'm like, this is like, this is absurd. Like, I'm like, like what's really going on, you know? And then yeah. you get home and stuff are locked down and two weeks leads to, you know, whatever. And yeah. <laughs> well, you had, well, we kind of talked on, on, like before we went live about how some of that kind of, I don't know if it, exasperated the injury or if it actually just made it so that like, I don't know if it made it worse, but it, it, it made it so that you literally like I me mean, just explain, explain what you're telling me about your, about the, right. Injury. Yeah. So basically like just being like inactive and sort of having that rest, it kind of just put a bandaid over my injury. Like before it would bother me, you know, every other day or every whatever. And I could get some therapy on it, you know, have a pill, have a, get a cream, get some work done and like, you're good to go. And, um, dealing with those day-to-day stuff it kind of went away because it was like you're not allowed to play anymore you're not, mm. not doing much so I'm, I'm doing home workouts and this and that you know and but it, it sort of put a band-aid over my injury and made me feel better than I really was yeah so um had I had the opportunity maybe to go to clinics or get an MRI and do do stuff like that it wasn't really happening you know stuff stuff was closed it was harder to do things you know so uh, for me, it kind of just like, I'm like, all right, I'm feeling better, you know, like, we'll see what happens. I'll wait up the pandemic and, you know, and kind of just go from there. So I kind of got like this fake security. I'm, I'm like, all right, like, I'm mm. feeling better, you know, like, let's do this again, you know, get back in shape and go back overseas. And, um, and that's where I wait for a year. Um, I didn't go back that first pandemic year. Um, it was kind of just a personal choice. It wasn't really like, I wasn't like afraid of the pandemic or anything. Mm. It was just, uh, my grandma passing away um so it was just a massive hole and like for me and my family and whatever mm-hmm. and i just i thought personally it was just best to stay home for that year mm-hmm. um and it was it was weird i i hated it at times but it was also like probably the best thing i needed you know like ever since i started playing as a kid it's been like two decades you know like you yeah never, you never had that break you know you're always gone you miss birthdays and you do this and that. And, mm-hmm. you know, so I have like a full year at home. Uh, it was really refreshing. It was good for me. It was good for my parents, you know? Um, so when I do go back, my injury, I thought has gone away and um, it just, it just started going downhill after the first couple of weeks when I was in England. So that was sort of where we had to pull the plug and sort of cancel the contract, fly back home and, and sort of mm-hmm. start dealing with it. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, again, like you're close, close to the, uh, not the end, but you're, you're close to another, uh, to the next step, I should say. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, obviously you're here now, so we'll, we'll kind of keep our eyes on you and see, you know, if, if not, not if I should say when, when you return uh, to playing basketball, because right for you, it's not even about like, of course you want to go play pro, but for you, it's about just returning to playing basketball because you haven't even played correct me if I'm mm-hmm. wrong and like how long how when was the last time you like ran up and down the floor with other players and like played the last time I played basketball was uh Halloween last year there you go so we're we're we we're, 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 cl- we're getting close to a year it was, yeah it was during that practice where I took a step and I was like oh that's it you know and uh so since then um then it was just a process of coming back home and shutting yeah. it down so yeah so you're close like i said you're close to a next step um you've obviously done tons of work so um yeah i'm just hoping you can get back at the court man because uh it's uh it always sucks when i mean basketball is one of those things if you're not injured you can choose to not play it which is which is awesome but it's there's something about when you don't have a choice in the matter that just makes it it's completely different, right? You're being forced by something. And again, 
I mean, I, I can't speak for you, but I know a lot of times people get injuries and there's some, there's always positives you can take from it. Right. Um, mm-hmm. But I, at the end of the day, we, we just hope to see you back in the court soon, you sooner know, than later. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of hoopers are the same way, man. We're wired the same way, you know, yeah. and it's, 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 it's like you said, when you're able to take a break, it's nice. You know, when you don't want to play, it's nice. But when it's taken away from you and you want to yeah. do it, that's what drives you crazy, you know, yeah. and, and for me, it's like a lot of ups and downs and pockets of dark times you know and and sure. you know like uh, where you gotta really dig deep and like man like am i am i really wanting to do this like do i really want to go through this to to keep going and mm-hmm. and you know having those doubts and stuff but then also finding that hunger again you know finding that yeah. joy in it and like i'm at a point now where i've taken such a huge break and it's kind of like i feel like a kid again you know mm. when I'm thinking about the yeah game, watching players and studying guys you know and yeah, yeah, yeah. And I feel like that that love and joy and like hunger is like it's kind of come back now because it's just been taken away from me from for so long. I love that. No, that makes sense too. That makes sense. Um, well, you spoke about the joy, you spoke about being a kid again, which is a perfect segue into me asking. Um, you know, when did you start playing basketball? Who introduced you to the game? What are some of those first first memories uh, of basketball? Oh man, so it would be uh growing up. Um, so I was born in, uh, born in Toronto. Um, I, I grew up there for like eight, nine years before we moved to Winnipeg. So I was like five, I think it's like my earliest memory of watching basketball and seeing like what it was. Um, obviously the Raptors were everything, you know, yeah, Toronto, Vince Carter. That's what I grew up in. Um, so basketball was blowing up like crazy. Uh, I was living in Brampton at the time. So, you know, a hotbed for players eventually. Mm-hmm. And I was five years old. My brother's 10. Uh, his, all his friends are 10, 11, 12, you know? Um, so basically for me, it was like, I get to see it on TV. I get to see the Raptors and I get to see this buzz around Vince. And then it's like, I have to watch my brother and his friends on the driveway in the backyard. <laughs> and I, I'm too young and too small to play, you know, but yeah. I just want to be around it cause I loved it. And that, that's kind of where it started. Um, you know, like my first influence, my, you know, first person hands on to really get me into the game was my older brother. Um, he's five years older than me. So at that, at that time, that's too big of an age difference physically to really be able to play together, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I'm kind of just that kid that's watching. I'm rebounding, you know, for the older guys. I never really got to play myself, but I, it just made me love the game so much. That I just always wanted to be around it. Like I would just sit on the driveway and watch him. Like my brother would be shooting around. And he'd be like, okay, you rebound for me for a hundred shots or like for an hour. <laughs> and then like my reward would be like, I get five minutes, you know, <laughs> but I was like, I will do that every day. You yeah. know, that's kind of where that passion and that love kind of grew, you know? So early, early years, um, my brother was my biggest influence and, you know, it still carried on and, you know, different phases and, you know, coaches he grew up and stuff, but that nice. very first one was, uh, was definitely my older brother nice nice and so then he kind of fan like a, it's more like a family it's it's really in-house it's you know your, it's your bro he's doing things at the time was he playing any like community or on any community teams that you remember yeah so he had before we moved from uh from brampton to winnipeg he had just started playing organized basketball i was a okay. little too young still so for me, it was still, I get, I get, I can go watch him. I can go watch him. Yeah. <laughs> I can, whatever he wants to do in the driveway. I'm just like passing to him, rebound to him, go watch yeah, him. Yeah. You know, and then I get a few minutes on my own. <laughs> um, so it was, he got to play. And then once we had moved uh, to Winnipeg, um, that's where it kind of, kind of started, like where I started playing more um, because I had uh, my cousin, Dave Brar, mm-hmm. played for the Westman. Mm-hmm. uh and soup Singh playing for the Westman. Mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. my cousin and very close family friend basically like an older brother as well um both playing for the Westman. kind of that's what got the ball rolling on, on me starting to play here so then where, what was your first organized experience how old were you and where did you play so it was uh wmba uh maples playing for maples, maples. um first coach was don maskew bison alumni from like yeah 70s uh, I was gonna something. say I know that I recognize the name but I don't know yeah, I, I can't see the played, face he played in like when uh when coach Lamont Don Lamont yeah I think they played together um one of my best friends Garrick Hutzel his dad Ron is like a U of W legend so they kind of yeah. played against each other yeah um so yeah like very first coach was Don Maskew shout out to Don man uh 
so lucky to have that. Like, you know, you signed up for community basketball, you know, it's just like, low yeah, basketball. it doesn't really matter, man. Anyone can just, any dad or <laughs> uncle or brother can just sign up to coach when there's no coaches. Yeah. Around. Yeah. So to have like an ex CIS player be your very first coach. Um, I think that's just kind of got the ball rolling and, you know, it just sort of took that passion and, and just like started turning it into like obsessiveness. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I guess the obvious question is, I mean, you had mentioned your bro was kind of like a first mentor to you. Uh, you mentioned Dave, you mentioned Souk kind of like maybe they kind of were there and they probably became mentors. Maybe when you, as you got a little older, mm -hmm. who are some of the other mentors? Um, and, you know, maybe just, just talk, talk about kind of like some of the effect that they had on you. Right. Yeah. So I felt like during, different stages of like your playing career of your ages you know it's different it's different guys right so mm -hmm. my brother's been that constant you know he's been the one since day one he's been you know biggest fan biggest critic you know high school university professionally um but obviously you know as i get older i'm more involved with teams and coaches um souk was souk played a huge part and my cousin dave was a huge part you know just having guys to look up to having guys to like chase you know mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. i wanted to be like them i wanted to mm -hmm be better than them, you know, mm -hmm. but I wanted to do what they did. You know, they play, they played provincial team. They got ranked. They played university. I was like, I want to do all those things. Mm -hmm. um, they played a huge part. Uh, Irfan, another, another massive, massive part of me growing up, um, like, you know, middle school years, like him, him being like an all Canadian, being one of the best players in the country, but still would always take the time to, to connect with me, to help me work on things here, work on this, you know, while he's doing something, he's like, Hey, go work on this, go mm -hmm. do this. Um, so growing up and having guys like that, you know, like in my, in my corner or like in my network uh, was huge. Um, coach Tacky, Coach Tacky was, and Coach Shep as well. Uh, both mm -hmm. of them all sort of categorized them together. You know, like I had mm -hmm. Tacky all high school, had Kirby all the university. And those guys are, they're more than coaches to me. Like they're, they're, they're friends. They're like father figures. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I like the respect that I have for them, for everything that they did. It's, um, uh, that I, I look at them as like uh, as a as like a best friend, a father figure. You know, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll still call them by their first name sometimes. But then <laughs> actually, I'll sometimes just say coach. As yeah, well, you know? yeah, yeah. No doubt, no doubt. That's in, that's interesting, man. Because yeah, I didn't know that. So, what was the talk about the connection with with Irfan? Like, was that just through? Because like, first of all, was this when he was at Winnipeg still? Yeah. And then it was just kind of like just through the connections. Were you were were you getting reps in on the other end, and he was there? Like, what, talk, yeah. Or, so. Just through like close proximity of you know with Dave and Souk, um, those yeah. guys just had a great relationship. They never really ended up playing together at UW, mm -hmm. right? But just being off by a couple of years and, and and whatever, just obviously the basketball community is small, right? So they yeah. like them being friends and them being together ended up by association that I'm there. You yeah, know? I got so it. If they're doing something, I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna be watching or I'm gonna be trying to get in on it as well. Yeah. So yeah. you know, to have someone like him while I was like in middle school and high school um to really like push him but also have somebody like like a like a shadow you're chasing you know like you want to be like him you want to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know accomplish and achieve the same things he did mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. so he played a he played a very big part and 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 he still even did uh, even after that even in university while he was overseas or when i was overseas and you know he'd always be checking in and mm -hmm. and so that was that was a, a really big part of of, of my development that's you know it's, you know it's interesting so i i i think i told you offline i interviewed uh daniel saki today actually and um you know obviously uh his his <laughs> uh he, he's cousins with tacky right so like they're actually like legit family well yeah. i don't know they're Ghanaian family they all say they're cousins but i don't know if they're actually cousins <laughs> but you know how that goes man yeah um, you have smart small communities like your cousins but in any case it's funny because when um he was telling me that one of his mentors um and someone who's who was advising him was was jared mm -hmm. and i thought that was really interesting so on the podcast i brought it up and i'm actually bringing it up intentionally because it's relevant to the conversation but also because adam's going to listen to this and other people is i thought it'd be really cool and, and and you're doing this whole next gen thing i know it's for the younger ages but we have quite a few players who are playing professionally um and have gone through the ranks whether it be in the nca or in or in u sport and I've gone on to play professionally. And I think it'd be really cool to potentially have like a, a mentorship program set up. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Where in some of these college athletes that are aspiring to go play pro or even whatever, they just have questions about college. Um, 
we could have kind of like a, a, a mentorship program where, you know, certain a player gets matched up with a few players who are interested in being mentored and, and, and those people obviously have to be interested in being a mentor as well. But I just thought, cause you just said you had some value just from having him around. And, and Daniel said the same, same thing about Jared, like he was able to hit him up and like talk to him. He said, and they, and they spoke so fondly of it. And I thought, it thought it'd be really cool. I know those things just kind of happen. Yeah. But it'd be really cool if we could make it happen more often. You know what I mean? For sure. Yeah, you know? man. Um, yeah. It's funny. Funny. You mentioned that. Right, my, my first memory of Saki is Taki bringing him to like my varsity practices. There you, you go. Know? Like, uh, cause his brother Desmond was one of my teammates in high school. Yeah. And, uh, so they, they, they'd bring him along, you know, we got this little, little, little kid, you know, he's like up to our waist, <laughs> not, not, maybe not even the, our he, waist. He was know? so small. I remember when he was this Man, like, <laughs> you'd be he'd hopping on drills. The basketball is like bigger than him. You know, and he's starting to knock down shots. I was like, yo, this kid is going to be nice when he's older, man. We're teasing yeah. Desmond. Like, yo, he's already better than you. <laughs> you know, my, it, it, that's cool, man. No, I my very first memory of, of Daniel Sackey was him coming to our, like, Sturgeon practices, you know, in JV and varsity. And he's just getting any reps, jumping into anything that he can. And um, and, and even cool. cool you mentioned Jared because he's been, he's been one of those guys as well that um, I've sort of tapped into you know, over the years, like when I was in high school, university, mm-hmm. we, we always get together, um, for, you know, for a couple of weeks in the off season and work out together, train together. And, and just another, just another guy who did something or is, was doing something that you wanted to do. Right. Yeah. So I was able to always ask questions, feed off him, and then just have that person to chase as well, you know, have yeah. like, have things to look up to and, and follow. So, um, yeah. even, even Jared was a guy who, who played, played a big part and still, and still kind of does, you know, like mm-hmm. when, when I'm healthy, but, um, we, we would spend a couple of weeks together in the off season, you know, whenever our schedules kind of match up and, and spend that time in the gym together. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. I mean, we have a gang of people playing professionally at this point and, or, you know, or that are on the verge of it. Some of these younger guys like Emmanuel and Daniel, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's, I think it's like, a, I mean, obviously different, there's a bunch of kind of different generations a little bit in there, but I mean, it's, uh, all, everyone's playing kind of at the same time or about to, which is, I think is pretty cool because I, mm-hmm. again, I, I wouldn't know the, the, the stats on this, but I'm sure that this has to be somewhat of a, a peak because I know there was the old, like the old, old guys, like, you know, much older than me. And a lot, some of those guys played pro, but mm-hmm. then there was kind of like quieter times. And then yeah. now it's kind of like come back again around where the people are actually like going out and playing. So interesting to see, um, Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm hoping that this, these conversations that I brought up twice now sparks, sparks a, a light bulb for someone to, to maybe start doing something like that. Cause again, like I said, I mean, the, the, the amount of value that comes from mentors and, and people that you can turn to that have gone through it already is so high. And I think it's an easy ask. Like, you're not, again, you're not asking the person to like talk to them 24 hours. Hey, just like once in a while, an email or a text or, you know, like, yeah. that, like for, for example, like imagine, you know, Daniel, for example, I'll just use him. He goes and plays pro somewhere, right? Let's say he goes and plays pro somewhere. And now he's just chilling by himself in some other country. And he's like, man, I just had something happen in practice. I want to talk to a, like, it's one thing to talk to your parent or a friend. They don't know. They don't understand. You want to like, Hey, I need to hit up, you know, AJ, I need to talk to AJ. I, I want to ask him what's going on or something. It would, it'd be, it would just be a cool thing to have. So yeah. anyways, anyways, enough about that. Um, I want to ask you real quickly about, um, now you, you're gonna you're gonna correct me real quick here if I'm wrong, but <laughs> so Sturgeon Heights, do you live in in out in that area? No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I had to bring it up. It's all good. I might, need, all, a, I might need a phone in Kirby here. <laughs> <laughs> we all know that people. Hey, I, like, look, man, I I was at Jean Sauvé, and me, me and Isaac transferred to Glenmont. Like this, it happens. Mm-hmm. People were were transferring all over the place. It, it's just the way it goes. But um, so two. Cause are you, are you a Maples guy, right? Yeah. 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 And then you put, but you played from grade 10 or was it was a grade nine at Sturgeon. Was it grade 10 or nine? Yeah. I was there for all four years of my high school. So, okay. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So you, yeah, so, yeah. so, so Maple got- boy, still proud you know, <laughs> in the area, you know, probably not going to leave the area. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was, uh, it was kind of a decision that like we made for sports, um, mm-hmm. You know, my parents had certain preferences in terms of academics and like areas of the city and stuff. So uh, playing that into a, a account with also like athletics um, yeah. and it was kind of we kind of came across like the Silver Heights Sturgeon 
option um, through Dave knowing Kirby, you know, when Kirby was assistant coaching at UW, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and Dave's like, man, like I know these coaches over there, super passionate. They're there before school. They're there after school. You know, these are the type of guys you want to be around, you know, Mm -hmm. they're make sure you're doing everything you can in basketball, but also they're on top of your grades, you know, like you can't Mm -hmm. play unless you're doing well in the classroom, you know, it's like, these are the type of people you want to be around when you don't, we don't know where to go or who to go to. Mm -hmm. Um, So funny story, the way, the way it worked was Kirby, Kirby kind of knew that Silver Heights was going to get shut down and they're going to move over to Sturgeon, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and being the smart by the book man that he is, (laughs) uh, (laughs) we couldn't out of the area just apply to that school because they were going to be capped out. Yeah. Well, being from the Maples, giving a Maples address, yeah. trying to go over there, it wasn't going to work. So he said, hey, if you go to this middle school and you finish your middle school here, you're yeah. automatically going to get into the high school without question. It doesn't matter what, what address you have. Yeah. So yeah. It started like my commitment to that high school started back in grade six. Like no I way. <laughs> grade six, grade seven and grade eight at Bruce Middle School. Bruce. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah. Place. So as soon as. As soon as grade eight was done, I was like, boom, I'm, I'm Matt Sturgeon, you know. And um, it's funny, though, like, even though I was in middle school those years, um, those guys would open the gym up for me in the mornings. Mm-hmm. You know, my mm-hmm. brother was going there, you know, my, my cousin Harmon, cousin Thornfall, mm-hmm. myself. Um, and, and so basically, I was working with Kirby and with Tacky since I was in grade six. You know, wow. they, would, they would open the gym up and I'd be playing with the varsity players, the JV players, you know, doing whatever I can. Like, I... I'm waking up at like 6 a.m. for all these these years in middle school just to go to the gym there. And then I'd go walk over to my middle school, mm-hmm. you know, just to make just to make it happen in high school. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. Like, I like I mean, it's one of those topics where some people might feel like, oh, like you can't talk about that stuff. But the, I like I'm on the side of I, like, again, I know they made rules against this. You should be able to transfer to any school you want, because at the end of the day, like nobody ever, if I said, Hey, like, I really want to transfer this great drama program, this great, no one would, even if I wasn't allowed to, but no one would balk in that. Like, they'd be like, whatever, like, yeah, that's good. You should, because it's going to help your future. Right. And if you have a unique skill and, and there's a program that's identified themselves as you, as a, an elite program, you should have the full right to go play there in sports in any sport. Right. And I don't think, I think, and again, you know, sorry, MHS, double like, I don't agree with the rule. I think you should be able to transfer. Now the school has to let you in, right. If it's full, it's right. full. But having said all that, I think that like, think about it. We're talking right now on a podcast where my entire career literally has been basketball. And had I not had some success as a basketball player, I probably wouldn't be doing this. Right. And, and so is that any different than someone's like, oh, yeah, I've been a musician my entire life or I'm an actor? Like, no, it's, it's no different, right? But for some reason, for whatever reason, I, I, I've never been able to understand this, especially here in, in Canada, especially here in Winnipeg, the athletics piece, um, it just gets disrespected. Mm-hmm. Like it truly does, right? And, and, and we, we know as athletes and any athlete knows um, that the amount of value that you get from a pursuit in sport is so high. You get tested emotionally mentally you have like there's so much that goes into it and so when people kind of just like balk at it like i'm just like you have no idea and i and yeah. so anyways i have no problem talking about it i think it's completely fine that people transfer and i and i and i and i encourage more people to do it when they have the chance to so that's right. just my piece i'm done ranting i'm sorry <laughs> if i offended anybody but i have to say it I just uh, have we, to. i'm sure we could go down that rabbit hole for quite some time you know and uh, but yeah. i completely agree with you you know to mm-hmm. keep it short you have adults that will stress over like what a teen wants to do, you know, what they're, what they think is best for them, you know, mm-hmm. like whether it's a kid for football going to St. Paul's or going to Oak yeah. Park or, you know, for basketball, it's like, well, that kid wants to do that. And he's pursuing that future, you know, yeah. he wants to maybe get a scholarship or, or whatever it is. Right. So exactly. I completely agree with you, man. Exactly. And like you, you tell me right now, like, again, this isn't a shot at whatever, like say you ended up at Maples, but Kirby and Tacky are two of the best coaches that we've probably ever had in, in this, in this, the last 25 years, right. There's other good ones. I'm not saying they're yeah. the best, but yeah. and, to, and to, to not go, want to go there. You're, what are you talking about? That's yeah. When that, like... that opportunity like, <laughs> was, was able to be real, like it was, it was, yeah, like let's, let's go do this. Yeah. And, and yeah, there's no shot at any school in the area, you know, since no. great garden city maples, yeah. like uh, we just didn't know them, you know, we had yep. just moved here, you know, didn't really know them. 
And um, honestly, like it's the same thing you said, like I probably wouldn't be who I am or where I am if I maybe didn't go to that high school. Yep. You know, yep. So. Yeah, no, 100 percent, 100 percent. So we, we, we talked about Kirby a little bit. We talked about you transferring to, to transferring middle school. Is this like a United States type situation? You <laughs> transferred middle school, but um, you ended up going to the University of Manitoba. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, because you, you ended up having a, a obviously wonderful career. I read off the, the stats at the start there, but correct me if I'm wrong. You did redshirt your first year, right? Correct. Yeah. 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 So I redshirted my first year. Um, and then even my, my first year playing didn't really play too, too much. It was kind of yeah. like year two of eligibility where it kind of yeah. took off. Um, yeah. So redshirting was definitely not easy, um, especially <laughs> coming from, you know, being one of the better players in the province. Um, uh, it's, it, it's funny how things work out. You know, uh, we had, we had talked about like me and Kirby, like, spoke briefly like in grade 11 you know kind of like hey i'm here you know you want you want to play play type of thing you know i'm going to be here you know so having that in the back of my head going into grade 12 was 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 a huge relief Mm -hmm. um just knowing somebody who like feels like family you know is is already there and and so when a lot of kids are like stressed and worried or they're like pressing you know when they play like oh i gotta get i gotta get looks i gotta get this and that like kind of having that that in the back of my head like knowing like i think i got something in my backyard like no matter what happens type mm-hmm. of thing mm-hmm. um it was very reassuring and i was able to sort of free fully just go through my grade 12 year and and do everything i needed to do and and then a few more options opened up but uh, essentially it was like for me i never really wanted to leave home i'm just you know uh, want to be around my family want to be you know uh, want to be my friends and and ultimately it was just that sense of pride of I wanted to represent where I was from, you know, Mm -hmm. where I grew up, the community that I kind of grew up in, you know, Mm -hmm. all the things that Basel Manitoba gave me throughout the years. It was like, I want that, you know, I want to play for that. Yeah. Um, So it was basically U of W, U of M. And the way I ended up committing to U of M, uh, it was just an agreement from the start. It was like, hey, man, you got a red shirt, you know, physically, you're just not, you're just not there. You know, yeah. skill wise, everything you are, but physically you need to get stronger, you need to get bigger, you need to transition as a student as well. That was a that was a big thing of his being able yeah. to you know translate being like a okay student in high school. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah like, you can be okay there, but if you're <laughs> if your grades aren't high enough, you're not gonna be able to play university. So yeah. yeah. Um so that that was a big thing, right? Um university was was a it was it was that first semester was tough. And, yeah. and Kirby sits down with me. He's like, Hey, like if you're on the roster, he's like, he's like, if your grades go any lower, he's like, you wouldn't be allowed to play right now. You mm-hmm. know, he's like, get together, you know, mm-hmm. like, like, come mm-hmm. on. Like, and um, that was kind of just that wake up call, but forward and like sort of going back um, when I committed there, it was basically, do I go to UW and compete for a roster spot or do I go to U of M and accept, you know, like I'm going to redshirt and it's a six year commitment, you know? Yeah. 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 And, yeah. Um, I haven't fully spoken with Rainbow, uh, coach Rainbow, um, but Stephen Tacky was the assistant coach, you know? So my mm-hmm. high school coach is the assistant coach there, you know, it was just <laughs> going to be easy to do that as well. Um, and I had like gone to a few scrimmages and like that little spring camp, and, like stuff like that. Um, after my high school season was over and I fully felt like, I'm ready to compete for a roster spot on this team. Um, and I ended up choosing not to go there. Um, I kind of wanted to take my own route, take a different route. You know, like, like I mentioned before, I had family mm-hmm. that played for UW. I kind of wanted to take a slightly different route and go to U of M. Mm-hmm. Um, having Kirby there, knowing a bunch of the local guys that were playing at the time, um, like Kevin Oliver, Xavier, Jonar, Curtis, Raiden Spear, Marco, Tanner, Keith, you know, like, hey, hey. you know, like all these guys. Right. So yeah. I was like, that's, that's what I want to go. That's what I want to be a part of. Um, and I don't think I would have agreed to redshirting had my, had I not lost in grade 12 in the, in the, in provincials. <laughs> like I, I truly felt like I was the best player in grade 12. I got ranked third, you know, yeah. I felt like it could have been any one of the top three interchangeably any night. Right. Um, and we, I felt like we were the best team that year and we yeah. ended up losing in the semis and stuff. And that kind of, that, that loss kind of humbled me a little bit, you know, like mm. 
I don't like university was always my, my aspiration and my goal when I was in high school. And I was going to do that by any means necessary. You know, I was going to go anywhere to, to, to achieve that. And I think had we have won, I wouldn't have been okay with red shirting. Yeah. Yeah. And I can look back and say that fully, like, I don't think I would have been okay with red shirting had I won the championship that year and losing and taking that L kind of like humbled me a little bit. And like those losses and losses throughout life like that are kind of what is like, would, would keep me going and keep me like hungry for something else. It's like, all right, like, no, this is, this is what you're going to do now. Like you're going to, yeah. you know, and, and the big thing that, that Kirby kind of drilled home was, and it made sense to me, you know, and I, I don't think I wouldn't say it's the right thing or this is what you should do if you're in my position. But for me, it just made so much sense when he's like, would you rather have a year when you're 18 and probably not play? Or would you have rather have that sixth year when you're 24 years old, you know, and, and like you said that, and that's that year that we go to nationals. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's crazy. So you, you just brought up nationals. So when I was interviewing Keith, your name came up because uh, it, it was Keith. Yeah, it was Keith and uh, the UBC series. Oh yeah. Yeah. What do you, what do you remember about that? <laughs> man, that's, uh, man. Um, that's that's the craziest little little time of of like student athlete life like sort of peak for us man we had like it was like a month of on the road home for mm-hmm. like a couple of days back on the road home for a couple of days back on the road like that that last year playoff and national grind was one of the most memorable times of my life my career whatever you know best memories and that UBC one, especially um, we, we started, we started building something pretty good at U of M, you know, mm-hmm. for a couple of years and we, you know, had, had a little bit of talent and some players. And then like when Keith was ready to come back to the team, it just kind of took a lineup over the top, mm-hmm. you know, it became really, really good. Um, and, and so like our fourth year was pretty good. We go to the final four in Cam West. We fall one game short of making nationals and we're like, Hey, this is, we're, we're going to be back here next year. Like we'll be back. Um, Calgary had ended, ended our season in my third year. Thanks to Jared. Um, <laughs> so my third year, Calgary ended our season in Calgary. Fourth year, Calgary ended our season in Calgary. Uh, fifth year comes around uh, and we know right where we want to be. You know, it's, it's training camp, but we're talking about Halifax. Kirby put up a picture of Halifax. He's like, that's where we're going to be. Yeah. You know, February, March, that's where we're going to be. Um, and, and that was kind of our, our goal. You know, we had a, a veteran, a veteran group, um, a lot of, a lot of pride, a lot of confidence in each other. And uh, we kind of got off to a shaky start, I think, cause we're kind of just, you know, a little coasting, you know, whatever you want to mm-hmm. call it, a little rusty mm-hmm. coming out of the gate, but we, we knew where we wanted to be and get to. Um, and by like the second half of the year, uh, we won the Westman classic, like back to back years. And, um, and we kind of just got the ball rolling from there. We ended up like, went in for like a month or two straight and going to playoffs. Um, and like the way the RPI worked out, it was, it was a very weird year because we didn't play everybody, you know, yeah, everybody, yeah, yeah. Play everybody, right. So you had sometimes like teams were matching up in the playoffs that hadn't played or they maybe played once or, mm-hmm. or rankings are skewed, you know, wh- whatever, the, or, you know, how RPI is calculated, <laughs> <laughs> but it just happens to be that we have to go play the number one team in our league. Um, and it's UBC. They've like second in the country, number one in Cam West. I think they maybe lost one game all season. I, I, I don't know. Um, but it was one of those of like, oh, like, yeah, Manitoba's going to go there and get their season ended. And for us, we're like, yo, let's go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There was no doubt in our minds. Like, I remember we had like a press conference at like Smitty's before leaving. And like, my, I think my parents have the little newspaper clip still at home. And it's just like saying, like, yo, I don't care who we play, I don't care where we play. Like we feel like we can beat anybody and like kind of run the table. And so we get to UBC and, you know, everyone has their, their own opinions of what they think of other teams and universities and stuff, you know, and UBC has got it nice over there. You know, they got one of the mm-hmm. nicest campuses and big budgets and, you know, they got big time players over there, like Jordan Jensen, white Connor mm-hmm. Morgan, like great dudes, you know, love competing against them, you know, and after, you know, you develop a friendship through all that competition. Yeah. Right. So playing against these guys, like, everyone kind of counted us out and we're like, 
nah, like we, we, we're exactly where we want to be. Like we like this. Um, and so to, to sweep them, uh, in their gym, uh, in that Thunderdome, you know, full of gym, they got the football team there. They yeah. got all their boosters <laughs> sitting there. Um, we had like five fans, maybe it was my brother <laughs> flew out from Winnipeg. I had like, um, Suk was our assistant coach. So he had some family there. We had a couple friends we had like six people maybe sitting behind our bench and the rest of the gym was UBC. <laughs> and so the first game, uh, first game was pretty close as back and forth. Um, we ended up pulling away at the end, like hit a shot or two and ended up winning by a few points. And, uh, the second night was, uh, was more of a, more of a grind. Um, but it, it was kind of like that wake. It was like, Oh, Manitoba just took one off UBC. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like, Oh, that's not going to happen again. They're going to bounce back. They're going to smack them two games in a row. Second game, kind of the same thing, back and forth game, back and forth, really gritty, grindy playoff game. And, uh, Alarion carried us for a lot of the game. He had probably the best game of his university career that day. Thank goodness mm-hmm. he did. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and yeah, so game's winding down. I think we're down by like one or maybe it's a tie game or we're down by one and he misses and Malik flies in for the old board. And it was just something that like, it's just like, it, just, it, was, just, it was just like a natural, you know, it's just like relocating, you know, like it's just yeah. like a shooter does, you know, like a, Shout out to John Giesbert, by the way. This is a skill that he had me work on. I was watching like JJ Reddick and Steph Curry and stuff, the way they relocate on O boards. And it just like clicked. I saw the ball go up, like the angle that it went off the rim. It just, I knew Malik was going to get it. Mm-hmm. So I quickly just like rushed behind him and got like, got set behind the three point line and made probably the biggest shot of my university career to <laughs> end up sweeping them. And it was the sweetest feeling. <laughs> <laughs> was that, was it, at, it was at the buzzer, no? uh i think there's like a like second a left or something yeah there's like maybe a second or two couple seconds left yeah, I th- didn't they get a shot off they did get a shot off at the end they got they got a shot off yeah so i think we had gone up by two so they yeah. had a chance to sort of tie the game um they had a look rimmed out yeah 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 uh, and then from there we ended up advancing to calgary and and that was the same thing it was like yo, they just ended our seasons two years in a row third year now we're back in calgary in their gym and we have to win this game to make nationals. And we kind of got over that hump and, and made nationals. Yeah, that's crazy, man. That's I remember that. And I was telling Keith the same thing, man. Like, I just remember following, right? Like, and it was just like so many, everyone, well, not everyone, but like the basketball community was was definitely like behind you guys, right? Because it was like I said, it's been so long mm-hmm. um, since that's happened. And obviously, like all the alumni and anyone who's associated with the program throughout the years was like following closest. I was one of those people, man. And it was like, just the, the, to see you guys break through. And like, again, you know, you mentioned Alarion, but like a lot of the team was like Manitoban guys, mm-hmm. like a lot, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. A lot of guys who were playing, like they weren't just like yeah. on the team, like they were actually like rotation guys. Right. And I think that was like a, a huge thing. And that's always one thing I appreciated about when Kirby, when he started building the team, he really like, you know, so he always got like, there's always been guys, you know, I can, I can name the, it's always, a, it's always a point guard and they're always like quick and fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's always like the same guy he always goes and gets, but yeah. the vast majority of the rest of the team is like made up of like local guys. And I always appreciated that just because it was like back before it was like switch and Winnipeg had all the local guys. Right. And so Kirby right. was like, no, 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 no. Like we're going to, we're going to yeah. do that here because there's yeah. talent, man. Like, you know, yeah, there is, is. And it was cool the way he sort of constructed his teams. Like there, there really is, there's enough here. There's yes. enough here to make your core, you know, yeah. and it doesn't always work out like that. You know, guys here and there will go away, but to have like a group of guys from like the same year or give or take a year or two kind of like collectively go up the years together and mm-hmm. have that local core, um you know mixed in with a few out-of-town guys of course yeah um it was also like a sense of pride you know it was yes. like we're playing for this university but we're also from here like this is our home you yeah. know and, and to have like your main six of eight players are from the city um and that sort of feeds into the momentum of like all oh, the followings getting big now like oh yeah. there's more and more guys coming to show love all the alumni everyone's getting excited you know reaching out on social media and stuff and yeah. it was just getting crazier and crazier by the weekend every win was just getting more and more love yeah. and, was, and we we felt that man we're we're i'm sitting in we're sitting in like halifax or i think it might have been nationals or might have been like our calgary game or something and i we had friends that like they they took over a boston pizza here 
and uh, Boston Pizza was streaming our our Bison games. They pulled down a projector screen and it's like packed, sad. and they're and they're scream, streaming our games. You know, like like things yeah. like that, getting, getting texts and calls and stuff like social media. It was it was, it was such a cool time, man. And and it re- you really felt like it wasn't just us doing this. It was like all the guys yeah. before us, and you know, like our community finally having this success together. You know, yeah. it, it had been a long time since a team was was relevant. Yeah, yeah. No, it's that's all facts right there, man. Um, so I got to ask, I got to ask. So, I mean, you know, you finish up your career, uh, obviously, you know, you guys didn't, you know, we didn't win nationals, but you went, you went to nationals. Um, and that was your last year, right? That was it after that. And so now you're thinking about what's going to happen next. We obviously know you went on to play pro, but was that the plan from the start or did this kind of happen? So I think like having, having like goals and aspirations were, was always like, it was like whatever, wherever I'm at, like what, what was like the next goal? What was the next aspiration, right? So when I was a kid, it was all about, I want to make the provincial team. I want to be ranked. I want to, you know, be one of the best players and play university, right? So when I'm in high school, it's all about playing university. And then it got to a point like mid-university where I really had to like sort of go through that red shirt grind, that early year grinds where like I needed to get better and our team had to get better, right? So it came a point in like my third year um, where it kind of took off, you know, I'm scoring a lot more, playing a lot mm-hmm. more teams starting to win games, you know, other guys in the team are improving as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so like that third, fourth year was kind of where it went from like, I want to play professionally. Mm-hmm. Like, I want to play overseas now. Like my mom, my mom's from England. Um, so I knew I was eligible to get my British passport. So after having a good third year, I remember like chatting with Kirby a little bit about it, you know, nothing too crazy, but it's like, Hey man, this is what I think I want to do after I'm done playing here. And then, so fourth year comes around, um, you know, and have a, another really, really good year. So during that fourth year, I kind of got the ball rolling on uh, getting my passport, getting my British passport, all the paperwork done. It was like, get a birth certificate from here, get your mom's paperwork, get your passport, you know, send all this stuff yeah. in. They reject me to send it back. Oh, you got to do this, you know, then I send it back. And, Um, so I was doing all that, like during my third, fourth years. Um, so by the time the fifth year came around, like it was like set, like, no, like I am, I am doing this. Like this, we're going to, we're going to have this season after that. I'm going to try to go overseas. Like that that, that was my, my next sort of goal or aspiration. And I think it, it it really, it really worked out because we were also surrounded by guys who wanted to do the same thing, Mm -hmm. you know? So having, having multiple guys wanting to do that it, it kind of like it wasn't a competition you know it wasn't like oh this guy wants to play overseas so he's going to take a bunch of bad shots get stats get paid <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah 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 you'll play when like you play on some like 500 stuff or whatever team right like we had four or five six seven guys really that played national level that played pro eventually mm-hmm. and and so having having a group of us want to do the same things it kind of drove us like to work together to be mm-hmm. like yeah we can do this together like like your success is my success. Like this team success is what's going to get us that recognition. You yeah, know, like yeah. we're not going to put up, we have too many guys where like one guy's not going to average 25 points because we're all going to average 15. Yeah. You know, so getting that success in playoffs and nationals as a group is kind of what got, got a little bit more spotlight and it co- sort of just drove us together, you know, like where you're not just one guy trying to go through this by yourself. I have like justice there and I have Keith and Larry on mm-hmm. and, and and um and, and john played after you know and then we had younger guys like like wagner and ziwa that you know like uh wagner played a little bit uh, played a decent amount in his first year for a rookie ziwa not mm-hmm. really because he's you know behind a, a lot of good better yeah. players but even those guys eventually got to that level as well so yeah having like this loaded roster with people with similar aspirations it like it wasn't like a comp like a competition as in against each other it was more of like a competitive like love for like we're going to do this together. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And so then like did you, you went, you did go and play. So you were planning it early on in your career. You went on the right after you finished, like the following year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so briefly, you know, what was that experience like? Is it, so again, like I know you played in that, in that, in that British basketball league. Um, was it what you expected? What were some surprises? Uh, what was it like? Just, you know, give us a general sense. Oh yeah. So yeah so fifth year ends um have like a month left of school 
so get through like the exams and graduate and stuff so it was nice uh, I kind of was able to time being done my five years and also getting my degree at the same mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. so I was kind of just done with U of M as all together at once um and then it's kind of like all right next chapter like I'm ready to go away now um and so yeah so that summer was 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 like a very unique one because it's different than any other summer you know mm -hmm. like in my past five six summers before that even 10 summers really like you know where you're going to be playing or who you're playing for right you know you're yeah. playing in high school and you know you're going back to your university team right so so this year was kind of different for that it's like i know i'm going to go somewhere i want to but you don't know when or where how right so it, it was kind of like a bunch of us are kind of just in the same boat together we're all just like hitting up a couple agents yeah <laughs> what happens you know like are they gonna text us back they're gonna email us back like one guy replies back to me one guy replies back to keith one guy replies back to him but not us you know like it was, it was like yeah. that um and um so I, I was fortunate enough i think that the, the passport was you know it was a big it was a big uh big reason why you know that that was a goal of mine and it was achievable as well mm -hmm. um and it also made it easier for agents yeah um, you know, in sure. terms of shopping an import player to shopping a player with a passport yeah um, so i was able to reach out to matt slan he had a lot of connections um and then you know he kind of got my name out there a little bit and then i was able to from there network a little bit more with people that were already physically over there um yeah. and i ended up like after a few months it was like i think late july august yeah where um i'm sitting on the couch watching netflix it was like 11 p.m and then I know where my phone just like beeps and I have an email and I look at it. It's like contract from Newcastle Eagles. <laughs> You're like, oh, I dropped my phone. I was like, what? So I go, I open up my laptop. I start Googling. Like I start searching stuff up, like learning about the place, learning about the city and stuff. And yeah, I was like, just like that. I was like, all right, here's your first contract. Um, be ready to go in two weeks. You're going to fly to England. Damn, two weeks just like that. Hey, yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. And I guess it's funny because like I've been to England just recently and I guess the, the cultural like, you know, you go play in a country where people don't necessarily speak English or it's very different. Like English culture is different, but, you know, it's not they speak English was a huge thing. So you're there. Everyone's speaking English. Did you experience any any forms of culture shock or was it pretty, pretty easy transition? Um, it was a fairly easy transition, like uh, compared to going to basically any other country. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I had been there before. Um, okay. so that, that helped um and like i mentioned my mom's from there so basically my whole mom's side of the family is scattered all around uk yeah all my aunts and uncles and cousins my one of my grandmas was there as well so i had a lot of family there so it was like something that was easy and comfortable mm -hmm. um i think the coolest thing of all that was the fact that i wasn't as close to them you know i'm, I'm you know you see each other for weddings and funerals really yeah you know? yeah you're not flying down there for a birthday party or something, no. you know, like we saw each other once a year, maybe once every three, four five, you know, like it was, we weren't very close and I'm like a very family oriented person with my family that I have here, you know? So I think the coolest thing of all that was like, even outside of basketball was to be able to like reconnect with my other family, mm. my other side of the family. Yeah. You know, yeah. The other half. No right. Doubt. And, um, and so that made it, very easy a lot of times very comfortable because there, there's days you know you get homesick you miss stuff you know like yeah you, yeah you open up instagram and you see all your friends are together and you're like oh, man. You know, <laughs> yeah 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 you're in yeah. a way different time zone and like can't communicate properly and yeah stuff. So, yeah you know and um so having having a few guys kind of doing the same thing as you're doing at the same time made it easy you know we had each other to lean on mm -hmm. um but being able to go there and have family definitely made that transition very smooth you know yeah there's no language barrier or anything to deal with that first year yeah exactly no doubt no doubt um all right man. hey we're getting closer than this we i think we keep, keep going i don't know how long we've been chopping it up for but i think we're getting close to an hour which i've done more than an hour so but we still have some more questions so okay. actually um i think you may have told this story already but i'm going to ask the question anyways so it's really just your most memorable basketball story, but I feel like you told it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so like basketball on the court, off the court, right. There's, you know, different, different, different memories or experience in that sense. And I think the coolest thing that, that like, you know, there's, there's memories of like, you know, when winning provincials with your high school team, you know, like 
so that was a very special moment for me um to win with coach tacky yeah um, it was like whatever in the entire school's existence they've never won a provincial championship before yep. so in like grade 10 we win one you know and he gets coach of the year so it's yeah. like he got the recognition he deserved because he was of that caliber you know yeah. and so that's something that's very memorable uh because he's like family to me you know and so to, to be able to do that together that also kind of just like took off my basketball career as well like playing wise yeah um so that's something that's very memorable that i cherish you know because some of my closest best friends are still from that team um you know there's the the nationals memories of you know traveling together with your, mm -hmm. your boys and stuff um but yeah in terms of playing overseas um having that opportunity just being so like like grateful and fortunate for it obviously a lot of things have to go your way yeah. and you have to work your butt off for it as well you know it's not like i'm yeah. sitting here like i'm six nine or something you know yeah like, yeah i have to work my can be the hardest working guy every single day to make yeah. that possible you know um but to be able to have that experience of like reconnecting with your family you know getting closer to them again um seeing the world like I'm sitting in school when I'm younger and I see like the Roman Coliseum in a movie or in a textbook, you yeah. know, or like a pyramid or something, you know, and, and to be able to like actually be there, you know, like you just like wonder like, Oh, like, Oh, it looks like this or all this. And, and, and then to actually be able to go there and like visit these places and like see these things all because of basketball. Yeah. That's kind of been, been the coolest part of it all. That's that's special, man. I, I guess it's a sentiment that so many of us share and I'd, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, again, you could say it about a, a lot of athletics just generally, but I mean, we're basketball players. So, right. Um, all right. So you may not have a, a, a funniest story ever, but I got to ask, man, because like I've heard some funny ones. I always ask funniest basketball story moment, whatever, man. I don't know. What what, what do you have for me? You got anything? Oh, man. Uh, yeah, I think I got something. <laughs> yeah, you're the, the, the smile on your face is saying you got some. Yeah, there's definitely <laughs> some things that are more. more yes. Yes. locker room talk you know, the, yeah there's the off stuff. off air stuff but you know there's a lot some of a lot stuff. of stories in like university and whatever of course of course um but off the top of my head funny basketball story you know i hope i hope some of my my boys from high school end up tuning in and, and hearing this at some point they're gonna cry laughing <laughs> um coach tacky we're in uh we're this kind of like a two-part thing because i think it happened right. in like a one week span all right he just had a week, you know, <laughs> so we win, we win a tournament and our team's really good. You know, usually in all four years of high school, we're like ranked number one or two or three or whatever. We're really good all four years. So we're winning a lot of games, a lot of tournaments. And so we win this one tournament. Um, it's like, we're up by like 30, 40 points in the fourth quarter. Right. So grade 11s are in, you know, young guys are playing. We're all kicking our feet up on the bench and, um, the last possession of the game, the other team gets like two or three old boards and scores a layup at the buzzer. And it's like, oh, Sturgeon wins the finals by 32 points. Yeah. You know, and so we're all like, you know, cheering and laughing, whatever. We get the trophy and we go huddle up in the in the in the locker room. And we get there and Coach Tacky grabs the trophy <laughs> and just snaps it right in front of us. <laughs> and we're all just like <laughs> scared i'm scared out of my mind you know like we're talking about of course. You know, it's like saturday night we win yeah all the boys want to get together and you know go do something and i'm just like he just snapped the trophy right in front of us <laughs> and he's like we did not win he's like on that last possession we did not win and i'm just like yo and we're all looking around like it was like if someone snickered and started like it would have started everyone would and it would we'd have been done he would have killed us it would yeah. have been like i was so scared it went from like being funny to like scary and but the message was i i i, I agree with the message you know it was kind of like you let your foot off the pedal because of the yeah. score you yeah. know so it, it was the lesson behind it but it was like the way <laughs> did it and then so that happened so like that next week we're all kind of on edge we come back to practice on monday you know practice whatever monday tuesday we have games and so that, so we, we end up having like a practice as well, where it's like, Hey, you have to touch this line in this drill, or you have to get this space, you know, like little details, you know, attention yeah. to detail, you know, you gotta be accountable for yourself and your teammates and, and, and whatever. And, and someone messed it up. 
or we messed it up like twice or something like that happens. And it's like, all right, you know, sideline run. Okay. All right, do it again. You know, you do it again. You get it right. Usually, you know, cause we're all scared. Like, I don't want to do this yeah. again. And then like, it happens again. All right, run, let's go. Man, make it. Boom. It happens again. You know, another mistake happens. This man, <laughs> I kid you not, I hope, <laughs> this, this guy had this Lululemon shirt that he's wearing. You know, Taki's not a small guy, man. He's kind of stocky and built. He had this, like, tight-fitted, like, dry-fit Lululemon shirt on. This man is screaming at the top of his lungs. Ah! And he just rips his shirt. <laughs> rips his shirt. Man. He's got, like, 12 abs. <laughs> he just rips his shirt and just, like, chucks it. And he just walks out of the gym and we're all like standing on the sideline, just like looking at each other like <laughs> no one made a sound until we went to the change room. And then we like, once we knew he was away from us and not around us died laughing. Yeah, of course. Like, of the course. Coach just oh. ripped his shirt off in of front course, of us. Man. Like he just, like, he just went like <laughs> incredible Hulk on us, you know, all five foot six, the coach oh. tacky, looking like a mean running back. Just, rips the shirt off and chucks it that that was probably one of those one of those stories one of those those times where off the top of my head i'll I'll never forget that so you know what's funny so while you were telling the story i was like oh he rips his shirt and i think i have to go back and listen to his interview either somebody told me the story or he told the story on his interview (laughs) and i don't remember because i think and i think he played it off like he was like I don't remember. I have to go back and listen to that. If any people are listening right now, you haven't listened to Coach Tackies, go back and listen to Coach Tackies or shoot us an email and remind me of where this story came from because I'm almost positive. Or if Coach Tacky, you're listening, tell me if it was you that told me the story on air because I'm almost positive he told the story. And he was like, yeah, I got so mad I ripped my shirt off because I asked him, I said, what's your funniest basketball story? I think that was it. I'm almost positive, man. Oh, man. Tacky's, hey, hey, that man, like, his his whatever he does is infectious is the best way to describe it like you know and the energy he brings or the focus he brings is very infectious right like if he's being focused and locked in then you it's easy to be focused and locked in if he's if he's bringing energy it's easy to bring energy like he he's a he's a giver of of of, of that stuff and i always appreciated that everything he preached everything he preached he, he led by example yeah you know, 100% the, the passion the accountability the commitment discipline all that yep. you know it was like He's opening up the gym for us at 6 a.m., 6.30 a.m., 7 a.m. He doesn't need to be there. He's, no one's paying him for that. Yep. Yep. You know, his, his class starts at 8.30. You know, he's yep. there two hours before for us, yep. you know, and, 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 and things like that. Like they, they kind of just like help mold us into, I'll say it helped mold me into a player, but the other 11 guys on my team, they're not playing ball, but mm-hmm. it helped them as people, yes. you know, and, and, yes. and that's, that, that's what he was, you know, whether you played for him, or maybe you only played for him in high school, or maybe you're just a provincial team player and you played for him, but he would go out of his way and do whatever he could to, to help anybody and be there for anybody that needed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's big facts, man. That's big facts. So if you listen listen to the interview right now, go check out, I don't know what episode it is, but Steven tacky, cause you'll everything that AJ saying right now, you will hear it in the interview, man. I think he even, like I, I think he talks about the rip shirt, but I also think he taught, he, uh, you reminded me of, I think, he brings up a player that wasn't very good. And I don't know, he tells the whole story, but go check it out. It's a good, it's a, it's a great interview, but um, all right, we're going to wrap it up real quick, but I have one last question. Um, always like to part with a piece of advice or, you know, pieces of advice um, from the guests, because, you know, we all have this, um, this story, these experiences, um, you know, you're going through one right now that is, is, is likely going to, when you look back at these, these, moments of your life because of this injury and everything probably in three years you're going to have some some pretty big insights from this right and so we gain these through our experience i really want to ask guests all the time like hey like you know tell us what you've learned so in this case we really want to focus on um for people that want to be professional basketball players people who want to play college basketball people who want to have high school success these are all things that you've done before if you had one person, we talked about this mentorship program. So if you're talking to that one guy and he comes to you, AJ, look, you know, he's in the seventh grade and he's like, I, like, and he already knows, right. Um, or it's a group of players. You're, you're giving a speech, right. Provincial team, for example, what would you tell those players um, that say they want to kind of go down the path that, that, that you went down? Uh, so basically like, I kind of like 
it's not like I have these like bullet points and steps that's like this is the textbook way this is how you do it right so I, I can speak on my experience mm-hmm. and and sort of the what I went through and like our like my processes and and to like tell my younger self or to tell youth um really like it starts with like truly loving the game you know like truly like falling in love with basketball and everything that it incorporates and involves you know like teamwork and accountability and stuff like that like really loving basketball like you can't do this for that long and be that committed you know and have two a days when it's plus 30 and all your friends are going to the beach and hanging out like (laughs) yeah you can't have that (laughs) Like, unless you really love basketball, you know, facts, and, facts. and that's, that's the big thing where, you know, I deal with hundreds or even thousands of kids a year, right. Through attack and basketball Manitoba and all the camps that we do and stuff with, with my friends. And, and we, and we always talk about that, like kids sometimes where you see it, where it's like, they're just doing it to, to do it. You know, they're just there to, to play or they're there because their parents got them there. Right. Yeah. Their parents yeah. signed them up. Their parents want them to. Right. Yeah. It's like, does the kid want to? Like, does the kid really want to? Yeah. And, and that's kind of where it starts. I feel like it's like developing that love and passion on your own. You know, like, do you watch basketball? Like, I'm like, I feel like a lot of kids nowadays, like they don't watch basketball, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. you can open up Twitter and open up Instagram and find some reels of like a couple nice moves and some dunks. And it's like, that's not watching basketball. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, do you, are you really obsessed with it? Like, and I think that's kind of the baseline. It's like where it starts. It's like, if you, if you do you truly love the game, you know, and then from there, it's like, what, what's your aspirations? What's your goals? Like, where are you trying to get out of basketball? You know, um, Kirby always says, famous Kirby line, you know, he gives his advice to us. And it's, it, it, it goes such a long way of like, use the game, right? Don't let it use you. Mm-hmm. Use basketball. Mm-hmm. Don't let basketball use you, mm-hmm. you know? And, mm-hmm. and so, so for me, it's like, you know, you start with, your love and your passion and you become obsessive over it. And then, then you have goals and you have aspirations. It's like, Hey, what's my, do I want to make the varsity team? Do I want to be one of the best players? Maybe do I want to play university, you know, and then you're in university, do I want to play professionally or whatever your goal is. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and this applies to things off the outside of sports as well. Right. Outside of basketball, but um, for, for ball, we're speaking. And, and I think that's kind of the next step where, you set out these goals for yourself, whether you're going to write it down in your log, you know, or you're going to tape up a thing on your wall. Right. And you have this daily reminder, you wake up you're like, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to achieve. And this is what I got to work towards. Or, or you just, you, you tell you tell your people, right. You tell your people like, Hey man, like mm-hmm. this is, this is what I want to do when I'm older. This is what I want to work towards and get towards. And you can't really guarantee. All right. If you have a goal, that's like an accolade. You don't really have control over that. Course. right you can't control the fact if you're going to be a cam west all-star mm-hmm. but you can mm-hmm. control the work that you put in you know yeah so yeah. you set these goals or like you chase these people like i mentioned like i was chasing ghosts right like i'm chasing players before me i wanted to be like them i wanted to be better than them right so yeah there's some things that i achieved that they did there's some things that i did that they didn't do but there's also a lot of things that they achieved that i never got to like i wasn't ranked number one you know mm-hmm. Suk and earth were mm-hmm. but chasing those things was putting in that work and and that's kind of what led to everything after that you know so having like your goals and aspirations and it kind of leads into like my last sort of thing that i'd say is where it's like you got to be real with yourself be realistic mm-hmm. with it right and be true to yourself so if you have these goals that you've written down that that you want to achieve now it's like are you holding yourself accountable to it every single day like is this what is this who mm-hmm. you are now has this become like what you want to be you know or how disciplined are you how much sacrifice are you making and and are you really like staying true and being real to this you know mm-hmm. otherwise it's just a pipe dream you know like i oh, i want to play pro one day i want to i want to be a starter in the university level but you know like are you training properly are you working on things are you working on your weaknesses are you mm-hmm. do or are you just going to get shots up on a shooting machine and thinking mm-hmm. that's what you do every day you know are you sleeping properly your nutrition you know, your recovery, like, are you really that obsessed where everything around your day revolves around like researching and reading and watching things Mm -hmm. to how to improve and get better on so many different facets, Mm -hmm. you know? So Mm -hmm. that's kind of like the, I guess the three sort of steps that I would love that, man. That's like, you almost put it together, like not, not a pyramid, but you kind of, you know, in, in, in sequence almost, you know, you started with the most important one, which I guess is, is, you know, it's, it's one thing, um, to want to play a game. It's one thing to even be good at a game. Um, but to, 
achieve the success that whatever your skill set you know warrants it requires you to be like you said obsessive or in love whatever you want however you want to define that and i think that's like bare minimum you obviously see people who don't love it and they still play at high levels but mm -hmm. those people tend to be seen as the people who didn't achieve what they could have you know so they're, they're like you know oh, like they, they just coast you know they could have been way better you know and uh that's not someone you want to be and i mean if you're starting from a, a place of wanting to, to achieve something man like that's that's an absolute 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 i would say it's like a you know 95 mandatory like you know you <laughs> some people might squeeze by but if you look at all the greats I mean, at some point they just were obsessive about it. So that, I think that's a great point to start. Um, and it's just good advice. It's all around, man. I think uh, we're going to wrap it up there. Um, it was, it was a good ch uh, chopping it up. I think we, we may have, I don't, I didn't, I didn't look at when we actually started, but we may have broken the record. I think we're close. I think, I think, I think, um, I think an hour and 15 or 20 maybe is our, is our longest podcast so this might be the longest one aj and, and I honestly man i couldn't even tell you what the time is right now man it hey just so, <laughs> no but the thing is you're good like you know you're a good talker a good storyteller so it's perfect because that's what whenever people are good man i just let them go man i'm like yo just do your thing because i'm not it's not like it's it's we're here to interview you and so a lot of times you're just like answering my questions as like i don't even have to ask them so it's perfect but i enjoyed it man um i obviously wish you the best in recovery i am looking forward to seeing you on the court again very soon hopefully um and then you know hopefully going to play pro or to be honest with you man doing whatever it is that you feel like you you need to do um because uh you know i know things change and things happen but at the end of the day man i'm just i'm just hope the best for you and i'm um, happy that you took the time to do this thank you man i really appreciate that um you know to, to have like you know, get praise from some of your OGs is, you know, it's very, it's very reassuring, you know, it comes around full circle, right? You're look, looking up to guys in your city that did something that you wanted to do, you know, and now you're sitting in a spot where they're kind of giving you some love back, you know, so thank you. I appreciate that. You know, appreciate you having me here and having kind of that outlet because I'm not really at a point where, you know, I really sit back and talk about my good old days. <laughs> when you do bring up questions, you know, like it doesn't happen all the time, but yeah. You know, have all those memories and emotions and, you know, all these people that played all these important parts, you know, kind of come back to you. It's, uh, you know, it, I, I love being out here, man. Thank you. No, I appreciate you. All right, man. You take care. All right. All right. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Please like, subscribe, follow and share this series and reach out to us with your comments on the show. Thanks again for joining us.